we have thus far spoken of worldly Christianity and the danger of the lack of integrity in the church. We did so by pointing out what integrity is and why it is a worthy thing to desire in our own character as well as corporately. The lack of integrity in the church at large is disturbing and very destructive to the glory, honor, and testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you can tell from the title of this message today, we will speak of the foundation of the church. And our passage today, both of them, speak to this issue. So if you would take your Bible and turn to the first book of Corinthians, the third chapter in our reading, and most of our message will come from verses 15, uh, 5 to 15, I'm sorry. Hear now the word of God. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on a foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has done on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. May the Lord bless this hearing as well as the reading of his holy word. Foundations are good things to have, would you not agree? Does anybody know what you're standing on when you stand up from where you are? You're standing on a foundation. No, not of wood simulated tile or vinyl, but concrete. That's the foundation. Strong and sure foundations are a real comfort, while weak and shaky foundations are downright scary. Some seek to build their own foundations and then build upon that foundation an enduring structure. But for Christians, the foundation is already laid down. And we are simply builders upon a foundation laid down by another, just as Paul was. Those who adhere to worldly Christianity, having abandoned the authority of the word of God and sought to please men more than their Savior God, have walked away from a sure foundation. But by God's protection and provision, there are those who seek to build upon the sure foundation that is already in place, put there by God himself. So as we continue in our study of worldly Christianity, let's keep in mind as we go on the first few lines of a poem by C.T. Studd. Maybe you've heard of him. He was an early 20th century missionary both to China and to India. You will remember these words because you've heard them before, but not all of them. Two little words I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. 
Then in that day, my Lord will meet to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only one life, uh, what's done for Christ, will last. While the world lives for today, Christians live for eternity. But as we rub shoulders with the world each day, it's difficult to keep this perspective as the eternal citizens of heaven. Keeping our priorities straight as followers and disciples of Jesus will enable us to build upon our God-given foundation in a way that is pleasing to Him. We need not, though, fear becoming worldly if... We keep our eyes focused on heaven and the things of God in dependence upon his Holy Spirit to enable us to do so. According to what we've read earlier in the word of God, there are only two foundations that can be built upon in this life. That may surprise you because we obviously understand what we're saying here. We're not talking about the foundations of this building. We're talking about the foundations of our lives. One is good and sure foundation, and the other is a weak and inherently bad foundation. So let's examine both. Our passage in 2 Timothy 2 that we read earlier gives Christians great assurance of God's love for his children, which is, is wonderful, and speaks to the certainty of God in his promises of both mercy for the repentant sinner and judgment for the unrepentant sinner. Our fitness for heaven is already assured, though, because, well, Almighty God has secured it through the life, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus on our behalf. We see that when we read that the Lord knows those who are his. Now, we can go back and say, well, you know, before the foundation of the world, that's all fine, that God chose us before the foundation of the world. Let's get a little more personal about that, shall we? Every single circumstance that came about the day that you received Christ as your Savior and were born again and given eternal life, every single circumstance was under the mighty hand of Almighty God in working it out so that you would come to salvation. Now, think about that. We have a hard enough time organizing a birthday party for our children. God organizes everything. And then we find that God has given to us our marching orders, as it were, indicating that he desires certain character traits, attitudes, and actions to be found in his children. That's reasonable as well. Don't we want our children to display some actions and attitudes uh, as well as some character traits that, well, we raise them to be? Surely. He says, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. You know, I've often wondered what would it be like in this universe if God was not good but evil? And since evil is self-destructive, it wouldn't be for very long before it showed itself. And we wouldn't even be here. But God is good. And he wants his children to be good as well, departing from iniquity. The promise that God's foundation will last into eternity is firm and subject, uh, not subject to anything that could cause it to fail. That is because the foundation spoke of, of is God himself. This is what we read in 2 Corinthians 3.11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And because God is God, dear ones, no one can thwart his plan and desire to save for himself a people. He wanted to, he planned it, he's working his plan, and he will save for himself a people. Praise the Lord that we are part of that. The results of the choice, though, that expectation of God is that he gives to us a choice. Each one of us 
can decide. And the decision has lifelong and eternal consequences. We can either serve our sinful nature, which leads to death, or we can serve Christ who gives life eternal. We can either depend upon ourselves to gain for us eternal life by our own criteria, or we can trust that God will grant us eternal life according to his criteria. You know, heaven belongs to, Je to, to God, to, to Jesus. Did you know that? It, it belongs to him. He made it. He runs it. He protects it. He makes sure sin doesn't get into it. And only those people that are pleasing to him get in according to his criteria. But whether we consciously choose one way of building one foundation or another, we are still in the process of choosing. Did you realize that? As the saying goes, not to decide is to decide. If you put off the decision to trust in God to save you into eternity for the sake of his son Jesus, who died upon the cross to pay for the sins of his people, then you remain in eternal danger. But to decide today is to choose wisely, for we are not promised tomorrow. If I was to tell you that you could win that Powerball lottery at $1.1 billion, but you must enter today, you wouldn't let anything get in your way, would you? Because tomorrow would be too late. Can you guarantee that you'll be here tomorrow? I can't. I can't at all. I can't guarantee that I will. I can't guarantee that you will. It's not in my hands in either one of those questions. And so today, as the scripture says, today is the day of salvation. As the psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. What greater wisdom than to rightly consider eternity and where we will spend it and ensure that it is the place that we desire. I would hope that we all desire heaven and do now what is needed to get there instead of gambling with our eternal future. And that is exactly what those who know, Christ, know of Christ, who have heard the gospel, who have been challenged to believe, and they put it off, they're gambling. They're the ultimate gambler. Each of us is building something, whether we realize it or not. We will all leave behind something on this earth for those who follow. Or we are preparing our defense for when we stand before the Creator God. One way or the other, we are building something. God will judge the lives of all men on the last day. And regarding the latter, we can only build upon one of those two foundations. The sure foundation of Christ or the very shaky foundation and ineffective foundation put forth by the world. Paul makes it clear in our passage from 1 Corinthians that there is only one sure foundation, and he says there again, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. When he speaks, Paul does, of laying a foundation, he explains that he was simply revealing to men what was already there, Paul did not lay that foundation. He opened up the knowledge by God's desire of the foundation that was already there. Now think about this. To prove Paul right or wrong, what did the early believers do? They went to the Old Testament. They went to Scripture. And guess what they found there? The foundation that was already laid. Paul didn't tell them a thing that they could not have found had the Holy Spirit wanted them to. And I'll give you an example or two of folks that had that understanding. Zechariah was one at the birth of Jesus, as were the wise men. They all had an understanding that something momentous was happening because of their knowledge of the Old Testament. 
the foundation of our salvation is not anything that is in us or that we can build, but rather it already exists and is Christ, as we mentioned, who has satisfied the requirements and made it possible to enter into God's heaven. The builders, and think about this one for a minute. The builders of, of Babel thought that they could reach heaven by physical worldly means. And what was the outcome of their endeavor? Utter, complete failure. Quite apart from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the, the confusing of the tongues, what would have happened if they had had the technology to keep on building? They would have reached space, at which point the building would have stopped because they couldn't breathe that high, right? What we know now, God was not trying to thwart their physical efforts. He was trying to thwart their terrible attitude of self-reliance in rejection of God's plan. And Paul, in our passage in 1 Corinthians 3, gives us the consequences of our building efforts in this life. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If we build on a foundation other than Christ and his finished work, then our efforts are eternally in vain. Eternally in vain. They're not according to God's requirements. Now, we may be saved, but he's going to tell us that we wasted much time. Surprising to many, the description Paul gives includes metaphors that represent precious things and common things, earthly riches and, and worthless grass. This introduces us to the reality that while we are all builders, we are all building something that God will hold us accountable for. Now think about this one for a moment. This is important when we have grandchildren, when we have spouses, when we have neighbors, when we have coworkers, when we have children, when we have any kind of relationship with any other person, this counts. If we live our lives as citizens of heaven, through faith in God's Son, Jesus, as our Savior, then we have a solid foundation upon which to build. But what are we building? And perhaps what we have built on that foundation will bring glory to God and please Him. Uh, certainly, I would hope that we should desire to make it so. But if we seek to build even good and right things upon any other foundation, then we will see our life's works destroyed. And the question will then come to mind, am I going to make it into heaven? Let me ask you a question. If you recognize that you have a solid foundation and waste the time, will you still be saved? Yes. Because it's not a salvation that is based on our works, but rather the foundation of our Savior who has finished the work. On the other hand, if you do good works outwardly, everybody says this is wonderful and your name is on the church, you know, so-and-so memorial church or whatever it is, and your foundation is simply that, that you want earthly recognition and have no foundation in Christ, what will happen to all of those things in the eyes of God when you stand or I stand before the throne of God? They'll be gone. Gone. The foundation must be sound before the building can be sound. If the foundation is faulty, then the firmness of the building is an illusion for it cannot stand on the final day of God's judgment. So we're all builders. Not foundation layers, we're all builders. And the question we must ask ourselves today is upon which foundation are we building? Let me approach this from another direction, if I may. 
with an example that's given by Jesus himself. If you have your Bibles, turn, and I believe you do, turn in uh, your Bible to Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27, just three or four little verses that have a tremendous impact when you think about it. These are the words of Jesus. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You remember that story from Vacation Bible School, don't you? And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And Jesus goes on and he says, and great was the fall of it. Why was it great? Have you ever thought about that? Because the expectations were that it would stand. That's why. From this parable, it's obvious that a solid foundation is very important. But let's not build upon a solid foundation a structure that is not in keeping with the desires of the one who owns it all. Why would you have the most solid of foundations and build a shanty on top of it? Those who build an ornate structure with a foundation other than Christ build upon the sand that is reprehensible, eternally dangerous. But just as assuredly as those who put a shanty upon the same foundation, it will be blown away. But what does it say about the children of God when we build a, a shanty on top of the foundation of Christ? This is the very problem with worldly Christianity and those who espouse it. It brings no glory to God. It is not in keeping with the truth of his word. It is man-centered, and it cannot stand the test of God into eternity. I cannot, in good conscience, tell you whether some of these preachers that you can get readily on the Internet or on the television or hear on the radio or read their books... I cannot tell you their relationship to the living God through Jesus Christ. I don't know their hearts any more than they know mine. I can simply tell you that if what they are saying is not in keeping with his word, he will not be pleased on the last day. Now, he may not be pleased with them as his children, redeemed by the blood of his son Jesus, granted, but... Then the question becomes, can a false teacher do good things? And the question then has to be asked, what do you mean by good? Is it good in man's eyes? Or is it obedient to God and therefore good? You see, we are fallible, finite humans. We can't see past somebody's face we can't see their heart we can't see into their brain we can't see what they're thinking we can't see what their hopes are we can't see what their plans are what their desires are we can only see what they say and do on the outside before we can make some faulty perhaps but indefinite decision on what their priorities are So, having the right foundation is essential, but what are we doing with that foundation? What are we building on that foundation? It's a dangerous thing to build upon the right foundation a shanty that is not in obedience with God's explicit commands. This is what Paul meant when in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, not only, uh, but only as through fire. 
there will be plenty of paupers, relatively speaking, on the streets of heaven who have a little bucket full, granted, but a little bucket of God's blessings who were great on earth because what they built was not according to God's will and not for his glory and not according to his word and they have received their reward on earth. So there are choices today. If you haven't made the decision to base whatever you're doing with your life upon Christ and his word, then that would be the first choice you need to make today. Period. No other decision. It's the only one that really is essential. The thief on the cross made that decision. Well, one of them made that decision. He decided to base the rest of his life upon the foundation of the one who was next to him and said today, when you go into your kingdom, remember me. The other thief on the other side, by the way, also made a decision. And he remained with his structure built on a very, very shaky foundation. So that's the first thing we have to decide is that we're going to have the sure foundation of Jesus Christ himself. And then every day from that point on, we have to make the decision that everything that we do, as much as we are able, is building an edifice worthy of our Savior. In the Middle Ages, they thought that it was a worthy endeavor to build churches as grand as they could as tall as they could. They came up with some fantastic architectural means to make sure that churches were, you could see them for miles when there wasn't any such thing as a skyscraper. They put money all over the place into churches. And they indeed, if you just go to Europe and visit some of these cathedrals and hear the music that comes from those choirs and those organs, you would be impressed. But God is not impressed. For if they were done to bring glory to the earthly church or to the Pope or to anything that was not God, they are useless edifices. This church could be more pleasing to God than the church in Rome. if it pleases God to keep us faithful and it is our determination to remain so. But each one of us as individuals have to make this decision every day. You know that uh, many of you do, some of you may not. My father-in-law wrote about nine books. You can find them out in the, in the lobby. When he was on his first book and we were on vacation down in Florida, he would remind each one of us every day, have you asked the Lord what he would have you to do today? And it got almost in our young lives to be a joke. It's not a joke anymore. I'm so thankful that he drilled that into us. I'm not going to drill it into you today. Aren't you glad? I'm not even going to call you and leave you a group text or anything like that to remind you every day. But I would challenge you to think of the value of starting every day with this attitude of, Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, for me, okay, I guess what I get to do on Tuesday morning, exactly what I did the Tuesday morning before, get up and drive a school bus. Okay. If the Lord calls you to menial work, where nobody knows what you do and you're doing it in obedience to him, that's a powerful brick in the edifice of your life. I don't have to be famous. I don't even have to be an eloquent preacher. All I have to do is be faithful. Somebody once asked me, they said, um, 
you seem to be as excited to preach to 10 people as you are to 100. I said, well, praise the Lord. I don't really care whether it's 100 or 1 or 100,000 because I'm really only preaching to one. And he is standing in the back and his name is Jesus. And after every sermon, he says, is that what I really said? Now, how should I answer that? How will you answer that when at the end of the day and you lay your head on the pillow and he stands beside your bed and says, how'd you do today? Did you do what I called you to do? Were you faithful in just the normal did you live your life as a Christian? Did you live your life thinking about, Lord, what would you have me to do? D do you care? This is the difference between a worldly Christian and a biblical Christian. A worldly Christian doesn't ever have any thoughts of pleasing Jesus. Ever. Except on Sunday when he wants to appear in his finest clothes or nicest dress, she, uh, in order to impress. But a true biblical Christian gathers together with believers to worship Almighty God in the name of Jesus and seeks to honor and glorify Him daily and not worry about what others think. But self-examination is very important to answer the question, would it not be a good idea as professing Christians for us to live every day asking, Lord, what would you have me to do today? Lord, what would you have me to say today? Lord, what would you have me to think today? Lord, how would you want me to spend my time? Oh, but this is trivial. Washing the dishes. Okay. Okay, if that's what God calls us to do, washing the dishes for the sake of Christ is more important than leading the armies into a victorious battle because it is an obedience to God's call. So there are our choices today, every day. When we build upon the one sure foundation or the one that will be destroyed once, that is settled then, what will we build on that foundation? What will we leave? Will we leave a structure that will last or that which will burn up? Will it endure into eternity? Will those we leave behind remember us as good examples of Christ-likeness? We're laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. How do we do that? I just told you. I just told you. There are many in the church at large today that would have us to build on false foundation. There are many that would have us build a structure that is pleasing to men rather than God. Shanties. Our response is twofold in this matter. In the first, let us individually commit ourselves to have an enduring foundation of Christ himself and then to build our lives in every respect upon that foundation in a way that is pleasing to the one who bought us with his own blood. So, have you ever heard of a lockbox? You know that thing they told us that all our funds were safe in for Social Security in a lockbox, right? Well, it sounds so safe. You have a lockbox. Did you know that? I'm not talking about it at the bank either. There's a lockbox in your heart, just like there is in mine. There's a sin that you keep and I keep in the lock. Uh, what? There's probably more than that in mine. That we keep there, thinking that nobody can see it. You can't see mine, so I'm right in that regard. And I can't see yours. So I'm just supposing here. But God can see it. And every day his Holy Spirit takes that divine key and opens up that lockbox and says, Here, Thomas, deal with this sin today. 
By the strength of the Holy Spirit, I am going to help you deal with this sin. When I have, in the strength of the Spirit, dealt with that sin, I have put a holy stone in the edifice of my life upon the firm foundation of the God who sees. In the second action, the second thing we need to do, pray for our leaders and those in our denomination that we might do the same corporately. It's not enough for me as a pastor just to want you as individuals and as families to do the things that are pleasing to God. I have a place in the church and in the denomination as do you. And we must pray that our denomination is faithful. And every other denomination is faithful. But we, we cannot answer for the church at large. We can only pray for them that they might become or remain faithful. But we do have something to say about our own lives and the life of this church. By the way, what is your part in this church? Now, I, I understand that some of us are visitors and some of us are members, and that's fine. What's your part in the church? The church. What is your part? All right, so everybody just got through with Christmas, right? And, and we had family and we had a great time, right? Do you have somebody that wouldn't show up? Do you have somebody that got all the invitations and just wouldn't come? Sort of strange, isn't it? Family. Well, I mean, blood is thicker than water, right? But yet you may have somebody that just doesn't show up, doesn't participate. Think about this for a moment. Jesus saved us by his shed blood. He died for us. We are adopted into the family of Almighty God. He calls us together not only to worship, but to work for his good pleasure. What are we doing in that work? What is our attitude, not toward this church, Grace Presbyterian Church, but toward the work of his church? Are we apart? We are saved individually, but we are not called to remain individual. We are called to be a part of the body of Christ, his church. Let's strive then as individuals and as a church for greater love for God and his people. Let's seek to humbly grow in the love and dependence upon the Holy Spirit to guide and protect us. And may the Lord grant to us his provision, his protection, and his growth in grace as we seek to be found pleasing in his sight. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who sees, but you're also a God who loves. You're a God who saves. You're a God who provides. Oh Lord, how fortunate, how blessed we are to be included in your great plan of salvation as your children. You have given to us the firmest of foundations, Jesus Christ, your son. Help us, Father. Help us poor and wayward sinners, saved by your grace, to build upon that foundation, that sure foundation, the strongest of structures to your glory. Thank you for blessing us with the possibility of doing so and the ability in your spirit to do so. Guide our hearts. Protect us from worldliness and instill in us a desire that grows every day to be found pleasing in your sight doing that which you have commanded and given to us to do. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus our Savior. Amen.